the time has come for us to put truth to power and speak truth to power and show that we're tired. Sometimes that boils over into the frustrations that you see in the streets. Look me in my eyes, I'm talking to you. Give me at least that Jesus. You don't feel my pain. You don't feel my pain. The cries for justice in the street, it's on us. The pain being made manifest for all America to see, it's on us. It's on us in this body to do something, to change the law. We can do that. Good morning. I'm Bob Costa, a national political reporter at the Washington Post. Today, we welcome back Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey, a Democrat, to Washington Post Live. Senator Booker is the son of civil rights activists, and he made a bid for president earlier this year. Before being elected to the U.S. Senate, he was a leader in Newark, including its mayor. He has worked on reforming police departments for decades, and he has now, again, focused on that issue amid this national crisis in America on race, on policing. Senator Booker, thanks for being here for a conversation about these issues. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having this conversation. Senator, let's begin with the news. What is your reaction to the latest charges in Minnesota on the Floyd case? You know, I think the up charges are very, very good things and uh, give some uh, sign of hope that there'll be justice done in a country which uh, has under prosecuted uh, police officers who've done wrong and who often uh, fail to get convictions uh, because of the uh, uh, very difficulties with which it is in America to convict a police officer who's broken our community standards and our laws. So this is a hopeful step in the right direction and uh, we'll see how this uh, case progresses. But clearly um, this is one case and uh, there's larger issues that this is a part of. And I think that what you see people um, so outraged, so anguished uh, out there uh, peacefully protesting throughout this country uh, is uh, speaking to the deeper uh, hurt and harm uh, that there is in having a, a national system of policing that still is so um, saturated with implicit racial bias uh, and, and disparate treatment. To that point, Senator, how does Congress, how do, how do elected leaders address that deeper hurt, that deeper harm? Well, you know, King Martin Luther King said so eloquently, I can't legislate you to, to love me, but I can pass laws to stop you from lynching me. I can't legislate to change a man's heart, but I can legislate to restrain the heartless. And, and so that's really what the role that we have through our official work. There are common sense changes to American law that have been, you know, uh, been demanded for uh, more than a generation of congressional leaders have been working on these issues. Congressional Black Caucus leaders, many of whom have been at work on these issues long before I arrived in the United States Senate. But I do think we all have a deeper role to play, all of us, whether you have an elected position or not, to begin to do what we must do uh, to address these issues through our own lives. And there is a deep, uh, um, injustices in our nation that we all have an obligation to do something about. And in this moment um, where I'm, I feel, um, just as an American, I feel very moved by how many calls, emails, text messages from people from all backgrounds saying, what can I do? Expressing their hurt and their anguish. I think that we all have to understand is that this question itself is important to never let go of, to, to, to not get comfortable again, to not stop wrestling and struggling with that question, what can I do? Um, because I think that we have yet to fully face in this country the persistent challenges of racism in America and frankly, how it has so undermined uh, the safety of black, black Americans and black bodies. And I say this because we live in this strange reality where we are not 
we, we, we literally make oaths, we, make, we swear pledges that this is a place of liberty and justice for all. But in America right now, the number one indicator, the most promising indicator to tell whether you live around toxic, uh, environmentally unjust sites that affect your cancer rates or your respiratory rates is race. We, we live in a nation where, which is shamefully the worst of industrial nations for maternal mortality, but black women will die in childbirth or postpartum uh, at four times the rate about of white women. I could go through every area of life. We still have fundamentally a nation in which uh, your physical well-being uh, is uh, it's going to be greatly impacted by the color of your skin. And, and that's something that's so um, uh, violative, so um, uh, against the ideals that we all cherish and we all have to be committed to addressing. It's so important you brought up the pandemic. We've been talking about that for weeks at the Washington Post, how much the pandemic has been affecting communities of color. What has it been like as someone who represents the city of Newark, the whole state of New Jersey, for communities of color to not only be dealing with a pandemic, but all of this strife and race and violence? Well, you know, it, I mean, it, this is what's been hard about these last, this year for me, is that the grief and, and it has just been building. It's built because, um, you know, I, I think I think I'm the only center that lives in a, a black and brown, low income community. Uh, and um, this New Jersey, I think, has more cases per capita than any state in America. And and it's been the, the black community that's just seen rates that are astonishing. So that was um, hurtful. And when you make are making spending your time as a center making condolence calls and hearing uh, the, the anguished uh, hurt of people who, who are losing family members. Then you compound that with this economy has disproportionately hurt African-Americans who are more likely to be in jobs that we call essential, um, uh, yet are jobs where people have to risk their lives to go to work, um, but yet are also seeing unemployment rates uh, are in jobs more likely to see the loss of those jobs. And then the final um, stretch to see uh, Ahmaud Arbery killed for doing something, jogging, that taps so into this visceral fear of the Central Park incident. Um, I don't know a black man in America that doesn't know that visceral fear for your life and how fragile the circumstances you live in are. Um, I don't know a young black man growing up that didn't have elders have to try to teach them on how to keep yourself safe in this society. I was seventh, eighth grade, I was already six feet tall. And I just remember that while there was excitement among some of the men in my family about the athlete that I might be, there was also fear that I had not understood it, that I would live in a society that I would scare people because they would perceive me as dangerous. And the conversations I had with my parents and other elders in my family, and, and that's not unique to me. This is an experience of so many uh, African-American men who are taught at a very early age to be afraid, um, to take measures to protect yourself, that just jogging in your neighborhood, uh, um, reaching for a cell phone, uh, 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 shopping in a mall, all of these things can end up entangling your life. And, uh, and so it's, 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 it's one of those moments where you have an economic crisis, a healthcare crisis, and uh, people capturing on videotape aspects of your life that all has now built into this moment where it's just so raw. And, um, you know, for me, I, I remember the Rodney King um, uh, 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 verdicts that led me to the streets as an early 20 year old just marching. And I remember writing in college a column for the Stanford Daily that I just, it was a night I just was my, I was shaking with rage that you could capture on videotape a human being being kicked and beaten, 56 blows, vicious, uh, uh, and that the people who did that could, could, could get non, not, not guilty verdicts. And I, and I remember writing in that column about your everyday life, even when it's captured on videotape, the, the extreme examples of the injustices, the, the, you still don't get justice. And you know, I, I pulled that column out and read it on the Senate floor. And even every time I read it, it makes me 
feel the emotions I was feeling as a 22 year old. And, and yet that was 30 years ago. And, and it's a column that if you just change the names from Rodney King uh, to George Floyd, there's just no difference yet. And why, so, why is that, Senator? I, I was reading your column this morning and you finish it by saying, dear God, help us help ourselves before we become our own undoing. Why decades later is America still having this conversation, this pain? You know, I, I, I think the, one of the most dangerous things is, is um, good people who, who, who don't feel or are not connected to through empathy and awareness, urgencies for change. And, and, and we, are, we are a country of good people that have shown incredible capacity. But, you, you know, I, I think that as, you know, James Meredith and Dorothea Cotton and Fred Shuttlesworth, all these civil rights activists, what their brilliance was, was how to get good people um, uh, off the sidelines of history, uh, into the streets, uh, into action until legislation changes the realities. The Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, the longest filibuster in the body in which I sit was a racist rant against civil rights legislation by Strom Thurmond. We didn't overcome those things because a bunch of senators got to the floor and said, you know what, hey, let's get this done. Or Strom Thurmond didn't say, you know, hey, uh, I, you know, I've seen the light, I've changed my mind. No, we got it because diverse coalitions of Americans, black folk, brown folk, white folk, Christian, Jewish, Jane, Baha'i, suddenly understood that this is, this is on me to change this. And we in this country have grown comfortable with levels of outrage. I mean, we are the land of the free. Think about this for a second. We brag about being the home of the free, the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we incarcerate as four or five percent of the nation's population, one out of every three incarcerated women on the planet Earth are in the United States of America, overwhelmingly nonviolent. And, and look at the people we incarcerate. We incarcerate the mentally ill at rates that are, that are astonishing, the addictive, poor, we've criminalized poverty. We, we, the majority of the women we incarcerate are survivors of awful sexual trauma. We do things to people in prison that are human rights violations, Just strapping down pregnant women, giving birth, putting children in solitary confinement. We are so disconnected from the things that are done in our name. It's the state versus a child who's being tried as an adult uh, for doing things that two of the last three presidents admitted to doing. And, 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 and yet we don't connect ourselves to that with a sense of responsibility. And so I, I've said this during my presidential campaign that, and, and frankly, during my life, that I just think that this is a nation that the challenge we have, and as much as my party often tries to personify it in Donald Trump, this is not about him. Uh, this is a moment that's not a referendum on a party or a person, it's a referendum on all of us. And will we become a more beloved community where the injuries and the harms of our, of our fellow Americans um, motivate us to, uh, to act? And if it's not, then this experiment will fail. Let's I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, let's pause there, because your, your point about prisons and the power of the state is worth reflecting on here. You think about the power of the state, not only in terms of prisons, but the militarization of the response to these protests. You have people speaking out who are not part of uh, your party. Uh, General James Mattis, the former Secretary of Defense, saying he's angry and appalled by how President Trump is using the military to quell these protests. When you, you look at that power of the state now in the streets, do you believe Secretary Esper and General Milley, should they resign protest? I, th I think that there is just a complicity um, with, with things that um, where people are showing a loyalty to party over, over uh, a loyalty to country that we know are wrong. When we are a nation whose institutions are, 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 are very, very sacred. And to have a president who 
will attack the media in ways that we haven't seen in, in modern America, but sound a lot like uh, authoritarian leaders and their tactics in other countries to intimidate, to bully, uh, to delegitimize. We, he's attacking the court systems and judges who don't agree with him or render decisions. Uh, he, he attacks uh, either them as individuals or, or the entire institutions seeking to delegitimize that accountability, the, the judicial accountability, the accountability of the press, anything that undermines his total power. And you have a lot of people who are um, submitting to that, believing that because of some loyalty to party or fear for themselves, they have to submit themselves to things that I know they know they believe are wrong, um, but they do it anyway. And, and that is one of the dangerous things in a free free society and in a free democracy. Um, uh, and, and it is the insidiousness that I see right now that even after Donald Trump uh, is taking this country in a, in a, in a, in a dangerous place. And, and somehow that has to that has to stop. Do you expect any Republican senators to come forward and condemn President Trump's conduct here? So look, I, I, I wonder, and I've thought a lot about over this last three years about when do bullies and, and demagogues, how do they fall in, in America in history? You know, whether it's McCarthy or Bull Connor, uh, 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 Wallace or Bull Connor, whether it's McCarthy or uh, uh, Father Conklin with his anti-Semitic rants. We, every generation has had demagoguery and people who rise to profound power and celebrity uh, engaging in the tactics that this president is. And what often happens, as we saw with McCarthyism, what we saw with Bull Connor uh, in Birmingham, is that uh, people with, of good conscience rise up to, um, uh, to condemn them ultimately. It's that, it's that famous moment in the United States Senate, um, uh, Senator, have you no decency? And so what General Mattis uh, and others are starting to do is you're starting to see the clarion call, the moment at which um, this man has gone too far. And I want to just, I want to let everybody understand, because he's literally trying to, what he does all the time, uh, is, is to ch change the facts in a way that's Orwellian to me. I mean, there are, there are international media to domestic media in Lafayette Park. There were uh, um, citizens with cameras that captured people who were tear gassed, uh, uh, the, the, the bullets, the way they cleared peaceful protesters, the irony of him standing in the Rose Garden, giving lip service to our precious ideals, and then to so viciously behind him uh, uh, be violating them. Um, this what is a moment where I, I've seen with some of my Republican colleagues in the Senate, a handful have had the courage uh, even if it's meekly to condemn those actions. And so I, I, I know that there's a lot at stake and I, I have so much love and respect for uh, Americans who are Republicans. They are my brothers, they are my sisters and they have principled stances. We may disagree, but this is so much bigger than party as, as George Will has come out and just said, he hopes that the Republican party gets a massive thumping in the 2000, uh, um, 20 elections because he knows that it may be a setback for, uh, you know, George Will, I've known him for years for things that he believes strongly in, but to allow a party to be so co-opted by authoritarian leadership that would so disrespect, not just disrespect, devastate, uh, uh, viciously attack sacrosanct principles is unacceptable. So this is a test, not of Donald Trump. We know who he is. This moment in history is a test of us. Who are we as a nation? Um, and how deep is our love? Patriotism is love of country. You cannot love your country. It's not sentimentality. You cannot love your country unless you love its ideals, its countrymen and women. And love means are you willing to sacrifice uh, for those ideals, for the, your fellow Americans? And many of us who are in power uh, often fail that test. On, on, and this is not exclusive to any party they put their position over the larger purpose of this country. And, and this is a test right now in America. We, we just can't afford to, to fail. Senator Booker, we got many questions from our readers 
at the Washington Post. One here is from Bill and Marie from Washington State, and they ask, is legislation prohibiting federal military equipment uh, being considered by the Senate in terms of it being sold or donated to local police departments? So uh, uh, Chuck Schumer, who just uh, 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 posted his head in here, is sort of giving me the hook. So let me answer this question, and I, and I will come back on to discuss these issues. What's that? Oh, um, uh, Senator Schumer's telling me to tell you that I'm on because we're going to a, uh, uh, for the Democratic senators to have a uh, eight minute and 46 second in Emancipation Hall, a, 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 a recognition and a memorial of the tragic deaths. And I'll just say that um, I know that uh, as a mayor that that these um, that often we used uh, uh, in order to uh, cash strap the department. Uh, New Jersey the city in the recession, we were laying off. I mean, I think Trent laid off a third of their police department. Was relying on help from the federal government, and often it was to get crit critical equipment. But I think there's a line there that we should yeah. not cross. The militarization of our police is unacceptable, and a lot of this military equipment is downright. It should put a chill on anybody who believes in free democracy. So the short answer to the question is that's something that I am I am looking at to be a part of a larger package that we hope uh, to introduce. Uh, Kamala Harris and I are, are, are leading on that in the Senate, along with the Congressional Black Caucus and the Judiciary Committee in the House, in getting something done as soon as possible. And I apologize um, that I'm going to have to run. Senator Booker, really appreciate your time at this moment in America, and, and best of luck with your work. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. We're going to let Senator Booker go there. Uh, he's at the U.S. Senate. Uh, Senator, Senator Minority Leader Chuck Schumer was calling him to go to a moment of silence just down the hall. So it was still good to catch the senator for about 20 minutes during a busy day at the U.S. Capitol. It's a strange moment there at the U.S. Capitol for reporters and lawmakers still socially distant due to this pandemic with protests outside. What a moment in America. And as we continue these conversations at Washington Post Live, I hope you continue to join us. It means a lot to have you participate with your questions your viewership. Uh, my colleague, Jonathan Capehart, who you know well, will have an interview later today with Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison. We talked about the charges with Senator Booker, uh, and they will discuss Mr. Floyd's death and what's going on in Minnesota to respond to that, both politically and legally. But for now, thanks for being with us. Stay safe and stay well.